welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. Today I am joined with Dinah Manoff. She is an award-winning actor and director. She's written for both stage and television and has had several short stories presented at the prestigious Writers Forum Speaker Interludes and recorded for KCRW. She's also had numerous roles on stage and in film, among them Grease, Ordinary People, and Child's Play. And she started in the television series Soap, emptiness and state of grace she's also a tony award winner for her role in neil simon's play i ought to be in pictures and won the prestigious la theater award for her stage adaption and direction of her father's novel a telegram for heaven she is the daughter of actress director lee grant and the late writer arnold manoff her novel which i'm really excited that we get to talk about today it's super fun is the real true hollywood story of jackie gold and it was also recently released as an audiobook so welcome to the show dinah thank you thank you for having me my pleasure i'm so excited we're going to jump right in talking about your book real true hollywood story of jackie gold would you be able to tell us a little bit more about what inspired you and what was like the most fun thing to write about this story Okay, well, let me give you kind of a synopsis of what Jackie Gold is about. Jackie Gold is a Hollywood superstar. She is a tabloid cover girl. Her boyfriend is People's Sexiest Man Alive, and her father runs a movie studio. So she grew up, show business is her life and her world. And she tells her life story. She narrates from the hospital bed where she's lying in a coma after jumping from a balcony to escape the paparazzi. So that's basically the world that we're in. It's Jackie versus the paparazzi. And um, the theme of the book really is what price fame and it deals with relationships and it's funny and it's touching. And, um, And I'll tell you what inspired me to write it. When I was a younger actress and I was on a television series, the name of which I can't say because of the actor's strike, but you can say it or you can Google it. Um, I, uh, one of the uh, journalists, uh, and I use that word very lightly, from the Inquirer showed up at my front door right after my first child was born. And he showed up my front door and um, announced that he was from the tabloids and wanted to question the paternity of my son. And with the newly found mama rage that I had in protecting my family, I screamed at him and chased him off my property. And then I called a really powerful lawyer um, and got whatever the story was killed. So this was not long after Princess Diana had been killed from the paparazzi following her into the tunnel. And it started a germ for me thinking about, you know, well, what if, you know, what if there was this big movie star um, and the paparazzi uh, uh, chased her to her almost death? And, um, And so I started to play with those themes and it turned into this novel, which has now turned into the audible version of this novel. I was really fortunate to get a copy and I sunk my teeth and I'm not done yet. But at first I was like, oh, this is going to be like a, a thrilling like weekend read. But then you get deeper into it and and it touches on really deep themes that I mean, even if you're not in the movie business are just across transcend like human experience. Well, I'm glad you said that because, you know, as I got deeper into writing it, I found that <laughs> Well, you know, it really took me into, you know, the realm of Jackie's relationships with her, with her mother and her father and her, um, her, her best friend who betrays her and 
this boyfriend who is everything good on paper, but not necessarily in the facts. And, you know, and I had a lot of fun and I worked very hard in flushing out those themes. What was one of your favorite parts uh, about writing that particular book? The the section for me that was really, there were two sections that were really alive for me. And interestingly, the ones about Hollywood and show business were the least alive for me. Because, you know, that to me, it's, to me, it's almost a cliche. It, it lives its cliche. It is what it is. You've heard that story. But the ones I loved writing about in this book was there's a section when Jackie goes to find her, the mother that's abandoned her, and she goes to Hawaii where her mother is living. And she, you know, I, I don't want to uh, say any spoilers, but she finds out uh, some family secrets that she didn't know existed. And I loved writing the Hawaii section because I've spent a great deal of time in Kauai, um, I used to claim that it was my second home, but it really wasn't. But I I spent a lot of time there. And and it was very evocative for me to use that setting, that paradise, uh, and Jackie fighting the seduction of being lured into that paradise and rebelling against, you know, her mother who um, who was living there. That and then the early childhood stuff in Malibu Colony, where I actually did grow up, was really fun to write because I grew up in Malibu Colony in the late 60s, early 70s, and it was a very different place than it is now. So it was really fun bringing back uh, those old uh, visuals from, from my childhood. What kind of books do you enjoy reading in your spare time? Ah, good question. I love anything Kevin Wilson has ever written. It is irreverent. It's surprising. It breaks the formulas. He, he just knocks me out. I love Ann Patchett. Barbara Kingsolver's last novel was brilliant. Uh, Shuggy Bain was a great novel. I can't remember the writer's name, but Shuggy Bain was great. I like pretty, you know, uh, character-driven fiction. And then sometimes I just like to read crap, you know, just <laughs> for fun. <laughs> you know? What is one of your favorite writing tropes, whether it's something that you like to write or that you like to encounter in books? I don't know that I have an answer for that question. It would probably take me all night to think about that and then come up with something <laughs> clever to tell you. You know, I was once asked by by a very good interviewer, uh, one of the, the book first came out, you know, what the themes were of the book. And I looked at him, I went, the themes? because really I'm not thinking in those terms when I'm writing you know I'm thinking about character development and character arc and you know where the you know inciting incident is and the you know which chapter that things should turn in and but I don't really the themes come to me later you know like the price of fame I'm like oh that's what that's one of the themes of my book what price well, I can say that, but I don't think in those terms. Yeah, and, and that's okay. It's because you're like deep into the creative process of your book, you know, like like you can't see the forest for the trees because you're just into it and into what you're doing, you know? Yeah, yeah, either that or I'm just inept. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. I mean, I, I enjoy writing myself and there's, you know, whenever you have beta readers, they tell you stuff and, you, and you're thinking like, did I do that on purpose? <laughs> well, you know, I was not, I, I was um, basically as a, it's another thing that Jackie and I have in common. I was basically a, a, a juvenile delinquent. I had a very, very overlong adolescence and I didn't go to school much. I, I, um, I dropped out of uh, college after a year and I, you know, barely graduated high school by the skin of my teeth. And so, you know, I missed a lot of education. Mm-hmm. I have really be- become a self-educated person. And when I first started writing, I felt uh, very keenly the gaps in my education and in my knowledge. <laughs> and themes may have been one of the gaps in my education. You know, as I've as I've gotten older, you know, I've I've come to accept my shortcomings, but um, but I'm still always scrambling to to make up for what I didn't learn academically. That's the beauty about 
life is that, you know, you can always learn something new every day and you can always be, be better. You know, you can choose yeah. to, to be better and explore something you didn't have a chance to learn because maybe your school didn't offer it or for whatever reason, you know, or you were just too high <laughs> or busy. I mean, it, it seemed like it seemed like you definitely had a, a busy, busy life growing up. Well, I, I had a, a busy, you know, teenagehood of of um, being on the beach and getting high and being interested in boys. So that was where my focus was when I was supposed to be getting educated. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then I began, you know, then I began to act. So there's, there was like, I missed the whole, you know, high school graduation kind of thing. And that chapter was, is missing. And you, you've done a lot of things in the creative sector, you know, you've acted and, you know, of course you're writing. Is there anything that you haven't tried that you would love to just dabble in? Hmm. You know, if you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have come up with a whole bunch of stuff, including directing a film. But I don't have the same kind of ambition that I had then. I'm so content, truly, with what I'm doing that I don't feel like there's any missing piece for me anymore. You know, I've gotten to do just about everything that I've that I could want to do. And, and the rest now is just gravy. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, when, when the book found a publisher and got published, I really felt such a sense of, oh, okay. You know, this is enough for me. You know, I've, I've had a great acting career. I directed television you know, I've walked away from Hollywood and from acting and directing in show business. I've directed theater. I've taught acting. I've taught acting in prison, which was probably the most rewarding place I've ever taught acting. I got my novel out of my system. I got it published. And as long as I'm, my husband and I and our kids are doing okay today, and occasionally the sun shines in the Northwest. I'm a, I'm a pretty fulfilled person. It is wonderful to hear because not everyone can say that they're content, you know, day to day. So that's fantastic. Yeah. You, ma- you mentioned briefly about how um, you had taught in prison. Can you elaborate on how that was? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the real story of why I went to teach in prison. Six years ago, our oldest son was uh, killed in a car accident. Hmm. And he was 19. His name was Dashiell. And as you can imagine, the world went upside down. It was a huge tragedy for for our family. And I pretty much felt uh, hopeless and non-functional afterwards. And one thing I've learned in my, you know, semi-long life is that the only way for me to be okay is for me to be thinking about other people. And I had always had an idea of taking improv and acting into uh, a women's prison. I'd always had an idea that that would be a really cool thing to do. About three months past Dashiell's accident, I went to uh, the facility that's about an hour away from where I live, and I pitched this idea for an acting class there. I told them who I was, and I said I wanted to do it for free. I didn't tell them why I was coming to them. And they said, yeah, you know, come be part of our High School 21 program. The women who take your class will get high school credit. And I was like, yes. And so once a week with my uh, one of my students and who became my acting teaching partner, we would go into Purdy Correctional, which is in Gig Harbor, Washington, and we would bring this class in to these women, some of whom really care less about what we were teaching, and some of whom were just, you know, kind of amazed at what they were able to find in themselves. And for me, for those two hours a week, I was fine. And it was my bridge back to being functional and okay, because we would laugh so hard and I mean one time we laughed so hard the guards came running because they thought you know something terrible was happening 
but it was it was a thrilling place to be creative and um and it bridged me back into uh being human again Mm. no that's lovely that's lovely it's always it it always feels good to give back doesn't it yeah and uh, I was able to teach I taught there for three years started a, a writing program there started an art program I mean it led to a whole other on a journey I never expected to find myself on and then when once COVID hit you know it all came crashing down but but I think you know what what needed to happen happened there obviously people's creative process changes depending on what they're doing and what role they're in but what has been one of your favorite parts about the creative process Well, well let me just tell you about doing this audible version so I write this novel and it gets published and and then you, you know you go out and you talk about it for a while and then it kind of like stuff starts to fade away and then I was approached to do the audible and so I thought, yeah, that well, that would be great. And so I sat down and I started, you know, talking into a microphone to see how I sounded. And I learned that I don't have the talent to play a hundred different characters. I've never been trained to do that. It's a whole art form. Who knew? I didn't know because I never done it before. So I called, you know, Mark Miller, who was my distributor, and I said, I, I can't do it. I, I think I could play Jackie Gold, but I can't play all the other characters. I don't have the chops. I, my vocally, I just don't have it, the range. And so I said, would it be okay if I just got a whole bunch of actors to play all the other roles? And he's like, yeah, how fun. And that's what we did. We went into a little studio here on Bainbridge Island. I didn't even have to go to LA. I, I got many of my former students, some of whom are, are working actors and actresses, some of whom are just the butcher baker and the, you know, grocery bagger. And we recorded this book in in our little studio at a at a facility here. And it was so much fun. I had not acted in years. And to get to put voice to Jackie was so freeing and so rewarding to be with my fellow actors and my students and all of us, you know, just doing this crazy thing on our island together. And then we would send the recordings down to LA to the distributor and he would edit. And lo and behold, we came out with the Audible. So this has been a a real labor of love and creatively way more satisfying than I, than I thought it would be. That sounds like it was almost like an old fashioned radio show. (laughs) <laughs> very much like that <laughs> very much like that yeah but you know what was incredible for me was to see how well the scenes performed you know we didn't know what we were doing until we you know got into it yeah it was great I was wondering who was one of your biggest role models growing up hmm. good question huh. well you know I'd like to say my mother and I'll say it in a complicated way. She was who I wanted to be and who I never wanted to be. And I think a lot of daughters <laughs> might relate to that. <laughs> but as a young woman, it was very complicated because she was a big star. She was extraordinarily talented, extraordinarily beautiful. And my relationship with her growing up was very um, combative. It was really not until I was in my 30s that we really made true peace with each other um, mm-hmm. and, found, uh, and found a way to grow together. But I so admired her gift and her talent. And I was also so intimidated by her gift and her beauty And there were things about her, like, for instance, when I left Los Angeles and moved up to uh, the Northwest to raise my kids, I had three little boys and a husband at the time, little, little boys. It was almost in taking opposite action from the way I was raised. You know, I was raised in show business. I was an only child. I was raised in Malibu. The work was everything. Work always came first in my family. And in in reaction to that, I wanted to get out of 
Los Angeles and focus on my family. I stopped writing for those years when the kids were young because I really felt that I wanted to give the attention I felt I hadn't gotten. Now, my mother, Lee Grant, is 98 years old. She is a pussycat and sharp as a tack, goes to Pilates once a week, and she is my hero and my role model. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of anyone I admire more in my life than her now. So does that answer your question? Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> that's lovely. I love that you were able to do your own thing and also still find peace with, with your mom and that you're both doing well. So, Yeah, thank you. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, Pilates once a week. Nice. <laughs> Oh yeah, she's oh, she's an incredible. You would never know that she's. I mean, ninety eight. Come on, on Halloween, this Halloween she turns ninety eight. Oh, yep. awesome! Well, happy early birthday to her then. Yes, yeah, I'll pass it along. Well, before we go, I'm going to ask one of the hallmark questions of the show. And sometimes people give really long answers. Sometimes people give short answers. But I found that there's never a wrong answer. And that is, in your own words, what does living a creative life mean to you? Oh, what a great question. Oh, my God, I want to give I want to give a better answer than anyone ever gave. (laughs) What could it be? Oh, my God. Well, here's what I know. I know that when I'm not being creative, I feel out of balance. I know that on the days when I get up and I make myself sit down and write or, you know, join a workshop or do my writing exercises or work on whatever project I'm doing, as long as I'm expressing myself creatively in some way, be it writing or teaching, directing, then I feel like I'm in sync, that I'm, I'm right where I'm supposed to be in the universe. Yeah, that's what it means to me. I like that. I like that. I agree with you there. Like I tell people that if I don't have enough creative time, I get kind of grumpy, you know? Yeah, me too. Me too. I get really out of sorts. And, you know, I always think it's about something else and that, you know, maybe sugar will solve it, but really I need to sit down and (laughs) do something creative. Excellent. Well, any final words for our listeners before we go? I think we've pretty much covered it. I'm, you know, I, I hope that they will, you know, listen to or read Jackie Gold. I hope that if they do, that they enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed living with it and getting it out there. And, you know, I'm really appreciative that you took the time to to talk to me about it. Thank you, Tammy. My pleasure. Well, listeners, please check the show notes for links to learn more about Dinah and to purchase her book and or in any fashion, whether it's via a hardcover paperback or the recently released audiobook. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for a creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.